in the last couple of weeks, what he's done. Is this still your view? Even more so. You know, when I when I say change things, he's he's certainly stirring things up. <laughs> There's no question about it. And I, you know, what I kind of he's he's kind of in a sense creating political chaos to a degree. But in, in terms of changing and well, what I would say fixing the the stranglehold that that the special lobbies, the special interests, and the the long-standing establishment politicians, kind of the stranglehold they have on the system. And, you know, behind that whole facade is really just big money that buys power. Um, and in terms of changing that dynamic, I don't, I don't think he's going to change it at all. Um, in fact, um, you know, I think a lot of these executive orders that he's that he's signing probably will get repudiated in in some way or other. I mean, we're seeing the courts are already repudiating the immigrant, the immigration uh, executive order, um, and so and now it's it, it seems like well, first of all, I don't think he's going to get his tax programs passed through because you know, if anything, now more than ever. The D.C. politicians need need tax revenue to pay for all the spending they want to do, um, and I don't I don't see any budgets being cut. I think the defense and military budget is going to go a lot higher. Um, I don't think Trump will be able to cut any of the entitlements. And I just I read something and I don't remember where, just just in the last day, that kind of alluded to, well now it looks like. There won't be any real reform on a, on the Obamacare legislation until 2018, which tells me it's not going to happen. So, um, I, I really don't see Trump going in there, and other than other than creating kind of um, you know a, a, a political frenzy in terms of the appearance of things. Um, I, I don't think he's going to do anything to change the, the you know, the, the sort of deep state control that's 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 developed over the last, you know, at least 60 or 70 years. Could you expand a little bit on the geopolitical risks you see are brewing right now under a Trump presidency? Sure. And, um, you know, to, to be sure that the geopolitical risks that are that are that are brewing it's it's not specific to what trump's doing i mean it's it's been it's been brewing for a long time probably at least the last four years of of the obama administration and you know you can probably tie it even back to the um invasion of iraq and i also think it's a situation that's being really ignored by the markets i don't think there's any kind of geopolitical upheaval being priced into the markets right now but um, and it's not so much Trump as it is the Department of Defense and the war hawks in Congress who are really trying to do their best to agitate Russia and China and I did a blog post yesterday there was some some options trader posted a really good commentary in Zero Hedge and it was it had a map that showed the area around Russia that was that's occupied by by NATO. There was a map showing NATO, Russia, and the Warsaw Pact countries fr from 1990, and then in 2015. And you can see that NATO has essentially surrounded Russia's borders <laughs> over that time period. Um, and and really, NATO is is just a it's a beard for the U.S. It's essentially. You know, the, the U.S. is is the primary driver. And the U.S. imperialism is a primary driver behind NATO, and the U.S. Um, put a bunch of of troops and and military assets into Poland, and then a week later, they moved a contingency of Marines into Norway, and it was the first time that um, foreign soldiers had had occupied Norway since World War II, and it's clearly aggressive, offensive overtures toward Russia. 
and I, I, I don't see how that's going to end very well. And the same thing's going on uh, with China in the South Sea. So, and that's that's been something that is really largely ignored by the mainstream media. Everyone's focusing on on Putin. And um, I had found a really good quote from Orwell, which I mean, it's kind of frightening, but it's because it's so perceptive and true and applies today. Every war when it comes or before it comes is represented not as a war, but as an act of self-defense against a homicidal maniac. And that's really how the D.C. propaganda machine is trying to, to um, position Putin as being the, the bad guy in this, in this relationship. And all you got to do is look at that NATO map and, you, you know, you can see who the aggressor is. Now, you said how the markets are really not reacting to all these geopolitical risks. You've also written recently about how, you know, the Dow hitting 20,000 is really meaningless. Can you expand on this? Sure. Um, you know, again, in terms of the Dow hitting 20,000, that's, that's uh, you know, I'll just sort of briefly summarize it from memory. But there's, of the 30 stocks in the Dow, uh, there, when the Dow hit 20,000, only only which was an all-time high only only nine of those stocks were also simultaneously hitting all-time highs and it kind of to me I I wrote about how it kind of speaks to um, the way in which they're using the Dow and the S&P 500 as propaganda tools and they're able to do it with a handful of stocks so in other words um, they they keep driving when I say they it's I'm talking about the Fed in conjunction with the Treasury's working group on financial markets, and and the too big to fail banks who, who um, help them out with their trading activities, um, but it, it's it, it, as long as they can keep driving the Dow higher, it it, it acts as kind of a, a message to to the world hey everything's great in the united states when in fact we know that's not the case so it's it's that it, it, they're using the markets as just another form of propaganda and they're able to do it with just a handful of stocks i mean if you look beneath the 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 facade of the dow and the s p there's a lot of there's several sectors that are headed that are headed lower and have been heading lower um and also many sectors that may be sitting on 52-week highs, but they're well below, say, their two- or five-year highs. So um, there, there is sort of a, a widespread deterioration going on in the stock market. You're just not seeing it in the indicators that the media always talks about and that people just sort of fall back lazily, and that's what they look at. And they say, oh, wow, the stock market's doing great. Well, it's not really. Um, in terms of the, the geopolitical risk and why it's not being priced into the market, I mean, you know, if, if a war starts or a war breaks out or hostilities continue to escalate, I mean, it's, gonna, it's, it, it's, it's going to escalate the risk to the U.S. economy and the Western Hemisphere economy and, and to the U.S. stock market by, you know, at, at, by geometrical proportions and the fact that you're seeing you know certain segments of the stock market continue to hit new highs tells us that the stock market's not concerned about it and I, I think it's something that's being ignored by the financial markets and it's at some point it's it's going to going to be one of the sort of the so-called black swan factors that that comes back and undermines the complacency that's that's um, infected the stock market. Now, what about the precious metal markets? Where do you see them heading under a Trump presidency? I know you recently said that Trump, if nothing else, is really actually going to be very good for gold and silver. That's a good question because there, there's going to be a natural tension between the Trump administration and the they that I referred to, meaning the Fed and the banks and the working group on financial markets that's you know collectively they're known as the plunge protection team or the ppt and that the source of that tension is that the trump administration wants the, wants a lower dollar i mean if 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 he's going to follow through on his plans to stimulate manufacturing and and 
traditional industrial economic activity in this country, he's going to have to take the, get the dollar lower because at, right now where the dollar is, the products that are produced in this country are just not competitive with the same products produced in a lot of other countries that have weak currencies relative to the dollar. So in, in, order, to, in order to follow through on that, Unless he's just going to try and erect complete, you know, complete trade barriers to everything, in which case inflation will be rampant in this country because there will be a fight to, to purchase anything that's produced in this country that can be consumed. Um, and I don't see that happening. So, you know, in order, in order to do it in a, in a more economic fashion as opposed to political fashion, he's going to have to take the dollar a lot lower. And that's, that's going to make it a lot harder for the they, the PPT, to um, implement their manipulation activities in the precious metals market. And so just, just by fact of, um, you know, a lower dollar and also geopolitical tensions escalating globally, um, I think the policies that that um, Trump is engineering and Shep herding are going to be fantastic for gold. Now, in your article about precious metals you wrote recently, you said that contrary to the mainstream financial news, China's appetite for gold remains really, really high. Can you discuss this? Sure. When, when right after the election, when gold started heading south, it was also right around that time that, that India had did their their cash elimination maneuver um, and that disrupted the Indian market for a while and based on numbers that were being put out by the World Gold Council a couple other mainstream fake news organizations that that track gold flowing into China the, the 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 common fake news propaganda be, you know turned in you know became oh well china's not importing as much gold as they were and the chinese government has put some restrictions on imports blah 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 and that there was no evidence or proof that china's government had done that and in fact based on the numbers that i look at every day which is deliveries into the shanghai gold exchange China's appetite for gold actually picked up considerably in November and December. Um, you can get that data at the Shanghai Gold Exchange website. I subscribe to a newsletter, um, John Brimlow's Gold Jottings, and, and he tracks it every day, so it makes it easy for me. Um, and as it turns out, uh, I forget which organization published it, but um, S Switzerland publishes their, the gold exports to various countries and as it turned out Swiss refineries exported something like 154 tons of, of gold to China in December um, these numbers are off the top of my head so they might not be exact but they're they're very very they're well within the ballpark um, and that's that's just an extraordinary amount of gold and if you just looked at the published Hong Kong numbers for exports Hong Kong exports into China um, those were a lot lower, and those are the numbers that, you know, organizations like the World Gold Council and Bloomberg News were using. But China also takes in gold through Beijing and Shanghai, and they intentionally do not publish those numbers. And the numbers that, that were, were being reported by Switzerland correlate with the amount of, of gold that was being delivered into the Shanghai Gold Exchange on a daily basis until the Chinese New Year when they when they took a break for for a week. But um, the reason why deliveries into the Shanghai Gold Exchange, I believe, represent how much gold is actually flowing into China, um, with one caveat there, is that every ounce of gold that is redistributed inside of China, in other words, purchased by investors or jewelers or what, whatever, has to pass through the Shanghai Gold Exchange. So you can account for gold investment demand by looking at the deliveries into the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Um, the only entity that does not have to, to purchase its gold through the Shanghai Gold Exchange is the People's Bank of China. 
this is the Chinese Central Bank, and that's the wild card that no one can quantify, and we have no idea how much the PBOC is 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 adding into its balance sheet every month. I, what I will say is that the numbers they're reporting are are not not it's fake news <laughs> because China is intentionally trying to hide how much gold is actually being gobbled up by that country. So. Um, and that's that's one of the reasons why I think gold is going to perform better in 2017 than 2016. Is you know contrary to the mainstream financial media reports, I think I think the demand for gold in China is is going to be even higher in 2017 than it than it turned out to be in 2016. Now some people are looking for new highs for gold and silver in 2000. 17 is do you see that happening or do you see that as a possibility well when you say new highs i'm assuming you mean new highs relative to the bottom that was put in in late 2015 mid mid december 2015 i i i i'm actually on record saying that i think tw that gold and silver will do better in 2017 than it did in 2016 which I guess would be another way of saying, yeah, I think the highs that we saw in 2016 will be surpassed in 2017. Um, I don't think we'll come close to the highs in gold that we saw in 2011 or the highs in silver. So um, I, I do think we'll see, you know, at the end of this year, when you look at the last two years, so 2016 and 2017, Gold will have traded higher in 2017 than it traded in 2016. All right. Well, Dave Kranzler, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had and where our viewers can find you online? Sure. Um, I, you know, I just, uh, in fact, I posted a blog post today at investmentresearchdynamics.com, and it was essentially... Um, discussing the fact that you know the, the markets especially the stock market is in a historical bubble right now and and if you if you were to apply everyone looks at PE ratios and they say oh well the PE ratio isn't as high now as it was in two, in 1999 2000 and it wasn't as high as it was in 1929 well that's not that's actually not correct because one of the things that's changed over the years is the accounting standards and they've liberalized them significantly in the last 20 to 30 years and they've liberalized them in a way that's enabled corporations to to produce gap earnings that are inflated relative to the same to, to the gap standards that were applied in 1999 for instance um, so you know, I, I can't prove this, and I don't have time to do the work that would allow me to prove it. But I believe that if you, if you used the same gap standards that were in effect in 1999, as are in effect versus what's in effect now, I think that the PE ratio now would be close to the to how high the PE ratio got in 1999, if not higher. So. Um, you know, people are people just. And no one's the market's not paying attention to to sort of hidden hidden factors like that. So, in other words, companies aren't relative to previous peaks in the stock market. Companies aren't even generating the type of actual cash economic profits that were they were generating in the past. And you know, in my opinion, this is the most overvalued, not only just the most overvalued stock market in U.S. history. I mean, obviously. Interest rates recently reached historic lows, and they're just off those historic lows. Um, and all of all of this was a product of of financial and political engineering put into place over the last 20, 30 years by the Federal Reserve and the bureaucrats in D.C. And so, in my opinion, this is the most dangerous market in in U.S. history. Um, but you can find my website at investmentresearchdynamics.com, and I have a couple of subscription newsletters that I offer that are connected with the website, and you can get details at the website. Once again, Dave Kranzler, thank you so much for your time. A lot higher. Um, I don't think Trump will be able to cut any of the entitlements. And I just I read something, and I don't remember where, 
just just in the last day that kind of alluded to well now it looks like there won't be any real reform on a, on the Obamacare legislation until 2018 which tells me it's not going to happen so um, I, I really don't see Trump going in there and other than other than creating kind of um, you know a, a, a political frenzy in terms of the appearance of things um, I, I don't think he's gonna do anything to change the, the you know the, the sort of deep state control that's 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 developed over the last you know, at least 60 or 70 years. Could you expand a little bit on the geopolitical risks you see are brewing right now under a Trump presidency? Sure. And, um, you know, to, to be sure that the geopolitical risks that are that are that are brewing, it's it's not specific to what Trump's doing. I mean, it's it's been it's been brewing for a long time, probably at least the last four years of, of the Obama administration. And you know, you can probably tie it even back to the um, invasion of Iraq. And I also think it's a situation that's being really ignored by the markets. I don't think there's any kind of do it with a handful of stocks. So in other words, um, they they keep driving. When I say they, it's I'm talking about the Fed in conjunction with the Treasury's working group on financial markets and and the two big to fail banks who, who um, help them out with their trading activities, um, but it, it's it, it, as long as they can keep driving the Dow higher, it, it, it acts as kind of a, a message to to the world: Hey, everything's great in the United States. When in fact, we know that's not the case. So it's. It's that it, it, they're using the markets as just another form of propaganda, and they're able to do it with just a handful of stocks. I mean, if you look beneath the the, the facade of the Dow and the S and P, there's a lot of there's several sectors that are headed that are headed lower and have been heading lower, um, and also many sectors that may be sitting on 52-week highs, but they're well below, say, their two or five-year highs. So. Um, there, there is sort of a, a widespread deterioration going on in the stock market. You're just not seeing it in the indicators that the media always talks about and that people just sort of fall back lazily and that's what they look at and they say, oh, wow, the stock market's doing great. Well, it's not really. Um, in terms of the, the geopolitical risk and why it's not being priced into the market, I mean... In the last couple of weeks, what he's done... Is this still your view? Even more so. You know, when I when I say change things, he's he's certainly stirring things up. <laughs> There's no question about it. And I, you know, what I kind of he's he's kind of in a sense creating political chaos to a degree. But in, in terms of changing and well, what I would say fixing the the stranglehold that that the special lobbies, the special interests, and the the long-standing establishment politicians, kind of the stranglehold they have on the system. And, you know, behind that whole facade is really just big money that buys power. Um, and in terms of changing that dynamic, I don't, I don't think he's going to change it at all. Um, in fact, um, you know, I think a lot of these executive orders that he's that he's signing probably will get repudiated in in some way or other. I mean, we're seeing the courts are already repudiating the immigrant the immigration uh, executive order, um, and so and now it's it, it seems like well, first of all, I don't think he's going to get his tax programs passed through because you know, if anything, now more than ever. The D.C. politicians need need tax revenue to pay for all the spending they want to do, um, and I don't I don't see any budgets being cut. I think the defense and military budgets going to go. Geopolitical upheaval being priced into the markets right now, but um, and it's not so much Trump as it is 
the Department of Defense and the war hawks in Congress who are really trying to do their best to agitate Russia and China. And I did a blog post yesterday. There was some some options trader posted a really good commentary in Zero Hedge, and it was it had a map that showed the area around Russia that was that's occupied by by NATO. There was a map showing NATO, Russia, and the Warsaw Pact countries fr from 1990, and then in 2015. And you can see that NATO has essentially surrounded Russia's borders <laughs> over that time period. Um, and, and really, NATO is, is just a, it's a beard for the U.S. It's essentially, you know, the, the U.S. Is, is the primary driver. And the U.S. imperialism is a primary driver behind NATO. And the U.S. Um, put a bunch of, of troops and, and military assets into Poland, and then a week later, they moved a contingency of Marines into Norway, and it was the first time that um, foreign soldiers had, had occupied Norway since World War II. And it's clearly aggressive offensive overtures toward Russia. And I, I, I don't see how that's going to end very well. And the same thing's going on uh, with China in the South Sea. So, and that's that's been something that is really largely ignored by the mainstream media. Everyone's focusing on, on Putin. And um, I had found a really good quote from Orwell, which, I mean, it's kind of frightening, but it's because it's so perceptive and true and applies today. Every war when it comes or before it comes is represented not as a war but as an act of self-defense against a homicidal maniac. And that's really how the D.C. propaganda machine is trying to, to um, position Putin as being the, the bad guy in this, in this relationship. And all you got to do is look at that NATO map and, you know, you can see who the aggressor is. Now, you said how the markets are really not reacting to all these geopolitical risks. You've also written recently about how, you know, the Dow hitting 20,000 is really meaningless. Can you expand on this? Sure. Um, you know, again, in terms of the Dow hitting 20,000, that's, that's uh, you know, I'll just sort of briefly summarize it from memory. But there's, of the 30 stocks in the Dow, uh, there, when the Dow hit 20,000, only only, which was an all-time high, only only nine of those stocks were also simultaneously hitting all-time highs. And it kind of, to me, I, I wrote about how it kind of speaks to um, the way in which they're using the Dow and the S&P 500 as propaganda tools, and they're able to